some of you experienced some connection problems when viewing the keynotes on Zoom and Shuetang X. Uh, for those of you experiencing those connection or technical difficulties, you can also try to access the keynotes on alternative platforms, which you can see on your screen. You can see the links for... access those platforms by scanning the QR codes below. Uh, but please do note that only Zoom and Shuetang X can record your attendance automatically. So if you attend the courses on other platforms, please do notify your uh, teaching assistant and she or he will help you record your attendance. We do hope that you've enjoyed day one. We had uh, Professor Shui Lan introduce historic and emerging factors in, Ch in China's economic growth, investment and in education and R&D. And some of you may have also participated in the webinar, Developing Leaders in Innovation. Following on this theme of innovation and cutting edge technology, we now move on to our first keynote speech. The speech will be delivered by Professor Harry Shum, who is currently an adjunct professor at Tsinghua University. Professor Shum's work focuses on current trends in machine learning and artificial intelligence. As a computer scientist, Professor Shum is world renowned for his research on computer vision and computer graphics, particularly the development of search engine Bing. Professor Shum is an international member of the National Academy of Engineering of the United States, an international member of the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK, an IEEE Fellow, an ACM Fellow, and former Executive Vice President at Microsoft Artificial Intelligence and Research Group, focusing on current trends in machine learning and artificial intelligence. As a computer scientist, Professor Shum is well known for his research on computer vision and computer graphics. The theme for this keynote is from deep learning to deep understanding. We have allocated time for question and answer, so please keep those great comments and questions coming. As a courtesy, please remember to include your name and university in your message. Thank you, Professor Sham. Thank you very much. Let me uh, share my screen first. Can you see my screen? So get, may I get started? Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me tonight or wherever you are around the world. Uh, <clears throat> I'm very happy to give this lecture uh, at the Tsinghua Global Summer School. Uh, the title of my talk is From Deep Learning to Deep Understanding. So I have uh, structured my talk really into two parts. Uh, the first part is more in the introduction of what's, what's going on, what's happening uh, in, in this field of uh, AI and the deep learning. And the second part uh, of my talk is really go uh, deep into a particular example uh, where I I believe you know we should pursue uh, if we actually want to move beyond just the deep learning to really understand what's happening there. Uh, I just want to give you a little bit of background. You know, it's hard to, for me to estimate. You know, the, uh, everyone's uh, uh, kind of a general knowledge in this field. So I would start slow in the first uh, 10, 15 minutes. So, but probably you have heard about the DNN if you come to this lecture. Uh, this is probably the seminal paper uh, people tend to believe uh, the starting of this DNN revolution. Uh, it's actually a uh, uh, November uh, 2012 uh, speech uh, magazine. Um, uh, actually, a very nice paper by uh, Jeff Hinton and the colleagues uh, from four different speech recognition groups around the world. Uh, including uh, Microsoft Research in Redmond. And my colleague, former colleagues, Li Deng and others uh, collaborated with uh, uh, Jeff Hinton 
when he did his uh, uh, sabbatical at MSR. So it was a huge success to apply DNN to speech. Then very quickly, uh, DNN was applied to computer vision and the most recently in natural language processing. So I will also get to that. Uh, so it has been very, very exciting. So if I may summarize uh, the, the great progress of uh, AI in the last decade, decades, especially uh, with the progress of DNN, I would say uh, I probably would use the following three sentences. So the first thing is really the unreasonable effectiveness of data. Uh, with a huge amount of data, and all of a sudden now we can actually learn a lot of interesting things. Of course, you know, the breakthroughs in algorithms uh, uh, are also key. But let me emphasize or maybe even overemphasize the, the un unreasonable effectiveness of uh, big data. Now, I will use some numbers to justify my view here. Then, of course, is the unreasonable demand for more and more computing power. You know, we're just more and more hungry about more computing power, which actually is going to cost us a lot of problems, if not a lot of money. Um, but my talk today is actually probably going to be even more so on the third point, that is the unreasonable procrastination of general intelligence. Uh, with all the hype about the DNN, uh, one could argue that we are not really that much closer to the general intelligence. Um, so those are the three things, you know, I want to make sure that you get uh, from my lecture today. Let me start with data. Uh, I use two examples here, and you know, one is actually in computer vision, where I would represent the amount of data uh, from the number of layers of the neural nets. And I'm going to have the second example in natural language uh, where I'm going to use the number of parameters used in those humongous uh, DNNs. Uh, this is a slide I borrowed from my former student, Dr. Jen Sun, and uh, uh, that was really after he and his team invented the ResNet. Um, as I said that, you know, DNN was really uh, became popular uh, probably around uh, 2012 and when it was applied to uh, speech recognition. Uh, then uh, Jeff and his students, you know, that realized this power and applied it to uh, image nets to computer vision. This is when the AlexNet came out to just completely um, shock the world with the, the, the amazing result and the performance uh, on the, the ImageNet data sets. Uh, AlexNet actually used eight layers of uh, uh, deep neural nets, and at that time it was unheard of. And very quickly people realized that. So by 2014, you know, VGG came out, and they, that actually used the 19 layers. Uh, then later on, you know, Google Nets uh, used the 22 layers. Um, but very quickly that, uh, um, you know, Microsoft research team uh, in Beijing actually invented uh, ResNet uh, with 152 layers. Today, if you are doing anything in computer vision, uh, you're probably using ResNet and uh, people nowadays don't even think about and uh, whatever problem they have in computer vision is start with a, probably a standard ResNet 50. But my point here is actually with 152 layers of the, of the neural nets, and that's actually a huge amount of the data. It's just, a, it's just a huge amount of the data that you need to even train uh, this level of uh, deep neural nets. So that's in computer vision. And the, I should also say that you know, by the time you know, ResNet came out and the, the classification, um, the results were so good that you know, they actually uh, pretty much you know, surpassed human performance. And the last couple of years, you know, natural language is actually the new battleground you know, for uh, DNN. And uh, uh, people are just uh, simply going crazy you know, with bigger and bigger models. Uh, only a couple of years ago, that's, you know, the, when Elmo came out, you know, people thought that's amazing. You, know, you can actually do this kind of work. And the BERT model was like uh, uh, huge and with 340 uh, million parameters. We were thinking about it, gosh, why did you need that many parameters? And you're probably overfitting somewhere. Then very quickly, GPT-2 came out with 1.5 billion. 
And uh, only a couple of months ago, GPT-3 came out so with 175 billion. And uh, before GPT-3 could claim the world record, and a couple of weeks later, Google came out with g Sharp with 600 billion parameters. And uh, you can imagine that this race is not going to stop and they just continue to have bigger and bigger models. And of course, you, in order to train this kind of models, you actually need a huge computing power. And indeed, <coughs> uh, that has been the key uh, to power all this kind of uh, progress uh, with DNN and the AI recently. And by and large, and the, most of the compu computers today you know, follow you know, von, Neum von Neumann architecture, where you actually have data and the program all together. Uh, this actually has the bottleneck uh, at the cache level, because as you pass the data you know, from core to memory, and this is actually a bottleneck. Uh, recently, a lot of people working on this new kind of architecture, including so-called neural computing, where you try to eliminate this monument bottleneck of cache. Uh, but pretty much today, I would say, you know, the, the most the computers are still uh, following von Neumann architecture. So the, the, the last the several years, uh, it has been, you know, amazing. You know, if you look at the progress in the amount of the computing power in sometimes we say the special purpose computing, especially I would say the rise of uh, uh, GPU, TPU computing paradigm and the GPU mostly from NVIDIA, and the TPU is really championed by Google. Uh, you can see that the number of teraflops that those systems can provide uh, is just uh, simply stunning. And uh, I must point out that you know, NVIDIA really uh, led the wave and benefited tremendously you know, as a company financially. Um, for someone like me who has been in the field for over 30 years, just think about that, you know, another chip company um, go past Intel in terms of market cap uh, is simply stunning. Uh, good for NVIDIA. Um, it just once again in the shows us that uh, in our fields in computing, you can never stop. You just have to keep going. Um, I look forward to even more teraflops, you know, in the coming years. So with all this kind of computing power, of course, you know, you know, it's not even never. It's never enough. So you know, initially, you know, you have all the CPU cloud, and you pack that to a GPU box, and then uh, um, because you know with one simple box, you know, you can train larger model with more data, and it's just easier for most of the researchers. But now people realize that even those big, powerful NVIDIA GPUs are not enough. You know, now we're moving on to those kind of GPU GPU cloud. Uh, we have those big boxes again. Um, so um, it's great that, you know, we continue to have that. You know, even in China, you know, even today, you know, this big news that the AI chip company, you know, the IPO. Uh, so um, again, it shows that the never ending uh, unreasonable demands of more and more computing power. But I do want to point out that, you know, with all this kind of computing power, you know, we actually pay for the price. There's a very nice paper coming out only 10 days ago uh, on archive uh, by some researchers you know, from MIT and other places. It actually showed that uh, um, they, 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 they are computational limits for deep learning. And the deep learning has been designed and, uh, by the very definition that you actually have some problems. And uh, um, it's just inherently expensive and it just requires a huge amount of the data you know, to do anything interesting. Uh, there are some very interesting uh, uh, numbers from this paper I want to share with you. Again, it's a really brand new paper only 10 days ago coming out. Like the bird model I mentioned to you a little bit earlier, like a few hundred million parameters, you know, to train a bird model, you actually need about you know, $7,000. <laughs> with the GPT-3 model, if you want to train a GPT-3 model with 175 billion parameters, you actually need 12 million US dollars. Uh, let me say it again, you know, $12 million to train a model. So that's certainly not reachable you know, by most of us. You know, a few uh, rich companies can afford to do that. So that's uh, it's actually a problem. 
And even more so, if you really want to get to uh, like a human level, um, if you want to continue to push and the, the certain benchmarks, you know, according to this paper, a very interesting number they actually you know called out, even with most conservative estimates uh, for more computing power needed to achieve you know five percent of the target for ImageNet. Uh, is actually going to be 10 power 5 more computing power needed. Uh, if you don't change the very formulation of DNN today, and uh, you, 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 you better, you know, pray for more computing power and uh, come into your way, and hopefully it's not going to be that expensive. So hopefully you get to the, get the point that, you know, in the last decade, that the, the huge progress with DNN, a lot of good things already happened. And uh, in addition to unbelievable algorithm breakthrough, uh, it's really because of the huge amount of data and the huge amount of compute uh, that pushed the entire field. But here comes the somewhat uh, not very rosy reality. That is, despite all of that, um, I don't think we are that much closer to the real intelligence. Uh, we don't really exactly know what we actually learned and for those things we kind of learned, we, it's actually difficult to explain. And uh, uh, some people now start to talk about that. Maybe we should go back to the, the good old fashion of AI to really rethink about the knowledge, cogn cognition, and the reasoning. So this is actually <coughs> where I want to show you some examples. So hopefully to convince you. So my former colleague, um, Marco Ribeiro of Microsoft Research in Redmond, and he actually did a fantastic PhD thesis from University of Washington. Uh, the, the next couple of slides are directly lifted from him. So he studied something called the explainable AI. He actually ran some deep learning models, and I believe it's either AlexNet or GoogleNet, you know, for this example here. So what he wanted to do is actually to classify you know, your picture, you know, to know whether this is a wolf or this is husky. Well, they look kind of similar, but they're really different. You know, you better be careful, you know, if uh, you take a wolf to your house, you think it's husky, then you might be in trouble. So he trained the model. It actually worked pretty well, you know, by, you know, common standard. It turns out that he applied and only got one, one result wrong. So, um, Five of them he got right, and the one got it wrong. But why? But why this one he didn't get? He didn't get it right. So he actually did a device the model called the line. It's kind of locally interpretable model agnostic explanation model, and it's actually very very nice. And he, you know, at a very high level, let me just explain to you that you know what he realized is actually where this model, you know, which pixels actually his model really used to classify whether this is a wolf or this is husky. So this is he, what he found. It turns out that for those pixels, he actually used, his model used to classify as wolf or husky. None of that by human eyes, you know, you probably would agree with me, none of them actually looks like wolf or husky. If you look at very closely, and you probably also realize that any of those pixels, picture where you, you know, use those pixels, they probably look like there's some snow on the ground. Then you say it's wolf. For those pictures, you have no snow on the ground and they look like the huskies. So it turns out that, the, that that deep neural net didn't learn anything, you know, about wolf or husky, you know, from at least in the human's point of view. And what it really learned, very likely, is the snow detector. So that's actually what's going on here. But that's in the computer vision. Let me show you some examples in natural language. And uh, uh, this is something called the adversarial attack. And I'm showing you a couple of examples here. On the left, there's an article about the Super Bowl 50. And uh, then there's a paragraph here, then there's a question, then the system is trying to answer. So the question is that, and uh, um, so 
what is the name of the quarterback who was 38 in Super Bowl, you know, 33? And uh, the answer is actually John Elway. Without this blue line, the, the system actually got it right. But with this blue line add-on as the adversary attack, and the system completely blew it and uh, got it wrong. So now you see you know, how brittle you know, the system really is. The right-hand side is another example you know, where there's a really interesting system called the text fuller. It's just by switching you know, a few the words and uh, you actually completely fool the system and the system will really classify this whole thing you know, as a negative or positive you know, feeling here. So that's uh, an example here. So I do want to show you, you know, you know, even more interesting example, you know, with GPT. Now I didn't have time to run GPT three examples, and uh, not I had uh, enough money to run those GPT three models. But I do have some GPT two examples here to show you. So the GPT two actually, you know, it's actually a very nice system, you know, where you actually can answer um, some questions, or you can continue to write some text you know, given some previous text, some actually looking pretty nice. And uh, at least you think it's plausible. Like the first example here say, well, you know, two soldiers walked into a bar. Then the system can actually continue, say, in Moso and uh, spend all of their money on drinks. That's kind of uh, plausible. And, uh, but the second example is completely, you know, just not right. They so say, yesterday I dropped my clothes off at the dry dry cleaner and they have to pick up, you know, where are um, my clothes? And the answer says, at my mom's house, this is totally wrong. Similarly, the next example, you also got the wrong answer. So here comes, you know, my hypothesis here. That is, uh, I think that if you look at those examples, you probably agree that, you know, the machine learning, you know, deep learning has worked like a charm, um, but only to the approximation. So it really worked very well when you have a lot of data, a lot of compute, and you focus on some specific task. Uh, but it doesn't really have the general intelligence. Uh, it doesn't really have what some people call the robust AI. So to me, you know, what's really exciting for the next decade uh, in the next five to, to 10 years in particular, I have some suggestions as well. Uh, but that's something that I want to, you know, explain to you in the second part, part of my lecture today. So as I said that, you know, you know, more and more people start to really think about this issue of narrow AI versus robust AI. With all this deep learning and the, what we have accomplished is mostly centered around a single task. With a huge amount of training data, especially with labeled data, it actually worked pretty well. But it's not very reliable. You know, it sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And as I showed you, the wolf was the husky, and there are many, many other examples. And of course, they are not really transferable, transferable to different settings, you know, without the you know, extensive retraining. And the one Favorite example I like to use is AlphaGo. You know, obviously AlphaGo is unbelievable, right? AlphaGo beat the, the human champion. However, it's not clear, you know, how we can apply AlphaGo algorithm to anything else. So AlphaGo has not solved the world peace yet or the world's hunger yet. So there's still much more for us to pursue. That's why, you know, people start to talk about robust AI or deep understanding. Uh, I highly recommend this book uh, by Gary Marcus, uh, Ernest Davis. Uh, it's called Rebooting AI. And uh, also, you know, Gary recently wrote a very long article called The, the Next Decade of AI. And uh, I you know, highly recommend you to read that article as well. Well, he really argued that um, we should go back to good old fashion of AI to really think about uh, those difficult problems of common sense, knowledge, you know, cognition. And uh, uh, we want to build the robust AI so that we can count on those AI to apply to a wide range of the problems uh, systematically and reliably. 
and we can synthesize knowledge you know, from you know, various sources such that you know the AI can reason. Uh, and of course, you know, just like humans, you know, the AI can actually transfer what it learns from one context to another with probably few shot learning or zero shot learning sometimes. So my own way, own thinking is that you know the, the result of ML should not be just a set of classifiers, you no know, one for each task. You know, even though it works really, really well, you know, in most of the cases by now. Instead, I think a robust AI agent should be able to continue to learn skills and knowledge just like humans by practicing. You know, sometimes we call this in reinforcement learning or by exploring. And uh, if you have all those samples there and they can be you know, supervised, and uh, uh, if you don't have those labels there, you probably do the unsupervised. Um, I have thought about this in a very exciting field, and uh, I thought there are three very interesting uh, um, directions I, I personally would like to pursue, you know, probably with my students. The first area, is, in my opinion, is uh, really building large-scale simulators. I mentioned about AlphaGo and all those gaming stuff there, but the autonomous driving is probably where we need to really build large-scale uh, uh, simulators. Uh, the second interesting area, in my opinion, is really go back to the basics of machine learning and why do we have uh, this kind of uh, really expensive deep learning algorithms, just like uh, this MIT paper I mentioned a little earlier. Uh, now we see the computational limits uh, of those uh, uh, um, the deep learning algorithms. Um, can we do better? And a lot of people are already looking at that. You know, I particularly like uh, one line of work, you know, championed by uh, Professor Yimai at Berkeley. Uh, it's really go back to the optimization function, uh, rethink about this problem. Uh, but I don't have time to get into those two very exciting areas today. And uh, instead, I'm going to use an example to talk about the third area of my favorite. Uh, it's really about you know, hybrid neural symbolic model for robust AI and uh, uh, using uh, an example, uh, using an example in natural language processing, especially uh, in conversational AI, to convince you that this is the right way to go. So this is actually, a, in my opinion, a very beautiful piece of work uh, by my former colleagues in Microsoft Research in Redmond. Um, so this is, as I said, is an example of conversational AI. They published this book, uh, this paper, uh, you know, almost exactly uh, four four weeks ago. Um, the paper is called the uh, the system they build is called the Soloist. Uh, what they do is uh, building task bots at the scale using a pre-trained, uh, grounded text generator. Uh, it sounds a bit mouthful, but I will get there and I will explain to you what, it, what exactly they do. So basically, they have trained an end-to-end -end neural model with symbolic constraints. And they do grounded text generation. By that, uh, I really mean uh, the results really make sense. And they actually did fine-tuning and uh, using fuchsia learning, which I'm also going to skip because of the lack of time. So let me make sure that you understand what we are trying to do here and in this paper. So this is actually a, a multi-domain uh, multi dialogue session. Uh, so this is what you will get if you actually talk to some kind of uh, uh, conversational agent or task bot or chat bot, uh, something like that. <laughs> so this is an example of completing a multi-domain task so produced by this paper and uh, produced by this method that they call the GTG, you know, ground the text generation. So the user starts the conversation by asking for a recommendation of a museum uh, in the center of the town. So the system identifies the user request and provides a recommendation based on the search results from an attraction database. Then the user wants to book a table in a restaurant in the same area. So GTG, the system you know, from MSR, you know, understands that the same area really refers to the center of town. So this is because they actually use that, they actually have this capability of co-referencing. 
Then they identify a proper entity from the restaurant booking database and successfully makes the reservation. So this is basically a diagram for a typical uh, uh, dialogue system. Uh, this is the classic architecture of modular dialogue system. So a typical task about, you know, consists of four things. The first is actually a language understanding module that identifies user intents and they extracts associates information from the user input. The second part is DST or dialogue state tracking. That infers the dialogue belief states. So what the user really wants and the queries the data set to obtain the database state, such as you know the, the, how many entities that will match the user goal so that you can update the dialogue state. The third piece is actually dialogue policy that it will select the next uh, action based on the dialogue state. And the finally, the fourth module is the language generation that will convert the action into a natural language response. So the language understanding and the generation modules can be implemented uh, using language models such as BERT for LU and the GPT for LG. So what's unique here uh, is really the dialogue model. Dialogue Manager, uh, which actually consists of DST and the policy. So traditionally, you know, in order to build this kind of, you know, modular system, you know, it's actually really, really hard, mostly by manual, and it's very brittle, and if you don't cover those cases, then they are typically the user will get lost uh, when using this system. So here is really, you know, how we have been really thinking about this whole thing and to build a more robust AI system, you know, by really using uh, uh, the latest machine learning you know, techniques, you know, try to build an end-to-end -end system yet. Common sense. Uh, this is, you know, we want what we want to design. Uh, this is how we want to do it. And we believe that we should do a hybrid model uh, uh, using you know, both in the neural approach and then the leveraging the symbolic representation as well. But doing that is actually hard in the, re the implementing you know, the knowledge and the reasoning uh, with modern machine learning techniques, DNN is actually not easy. Uh, certainly there is a huge advantage there doing deep learning uh, for knowledge representation and uh, dialogue state tracking. Um, so this is actually a system we have built and uh, uh, let me walk you through and uh, uh, what's really happening here. So it shows you know, how we formulate uh, this new modular dialogue system as an autoregressive model. So the modular system can be viewed as a data generation pipeline uh, consisting of four different units. That is the NLU, DST, you know, policy generation, and NLG. You know, they actually process data in sequence you know, where the output of a previous module is the input of the next module. So if we implement each module using a transformer-based neural network, then we allow all those neural networks to share the parameters and uh, then the whole pipeline can be implemented using a transformer module. That is exactly uh, what we call a GTG, a grounded uh, text generation. I explained to you, you know, why you know, we say that. So since the GTG actually plays different roles in the process of generating a response, we use the multitask learning to pre-train GTG on large amount of heterogeneous data. So there are really three tasks here. So we use this multitask training. So the task one is the belief state prediction, trained on the dialogue history, belief state pairs. And the task two is really the core here, that is the grounded response generation and trained on input, output pairs, 
whereas the input is the concatenation of dialogue history, belief states, and the database state, and the output is the de uh, lexicalized response. Finally, the task three, uh, we use the contrastive learning. So we view each dialogue turn in training data as a positive example. Then we sample a few negative examples by placing one of the items with a randomly sampled item. And uh, um, that's how we actually do it. And the GTG learned to give the higher scores to a positive example and the lower scores to the, uh, 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 the negative example. Uh, I don't need to bother you with more, you know, mathematics here, but you just need to believe me that, you know, you write down all those equations and, uh, you know, you pretty much can solve that. And eventually you get this transformer-based GTG model. So I do want to make a comment, a few comments about the you know, GPT versus GTG, right? So the GPT is this, you know, fancy model. You probably have heard, you probably have read the papers. Uh, you know, if you haven't seen the GPT-3 you know, paper, which just came out a couple of months ago, and you are welcome to flip through it, and uh, uh, there's really not much, you know, huge insight there. Uh, the results are very impressive, uh, but you get the basic idea, probably GPT-2 paper is probably more uh, uh, informing. In any case, you know, GPT, whether it's GPT-2 or GPT-3, they learn uh, to, to understand and generate natural language. So they pre-trained on raw text and they fine-tuned it to perform specific language understanding and generation tasks. So they basically learn how to talk like a human, you know, learn from all the raw text. But what we are doing here in this project is very different. So GTG is actually learned to predict the dialogue states and the generate a grounded response for task completion. So, so what we are learning here is actually what to say to get the job done. So that's the difference. Uh, so here's an example that's uh, um, basically showing that, you know, GPT-2 uh, with this kind of a dialogue history, GPT-2 will generate something that's completely useless. And the GTG, you know, what we have shown here is that, you know, uh, not only we can get this delexicalized response, and we can also plug in the database, get the grounded the, the result. Uh, that's probably, you know, what the users really want anyway. So I'm quickly going to walk you through, you know, how we actually evaluate our system and uh, to show, you know, the, uh, our results are really, really good. So the, we evaluate on two public benchmarks and uh, it's important to understand how to evaluate this kind of systems. Uh, there are really a few dimensions here. And the one is, you know, I inform measures whether a bot provides a correct entity that matches the user goal. Second is actually the success measures whether a bot also answers or requests the information. Then there's this uh, traditional blue score and the natural language that really measures the fluency and whether it talks like a human. And then we'll put together with a combined score and uh, um, we'll see how, how we actually get that to compare with others. So we have this data set used for the pre-training and uh, here's uh, the result. So the, the, it's really worked out really, really well and uh, compared it with the state of the art. Um, so most of the previous previous uh, uh, systems were not really you know, the grounded and uh, uh, except that this uh, uh, DSTC-8 winner, uh, they kind of uh, are partially grounded. But in any case that, you know, our results you know, significantly better uh, by using this uh, hybrid model that is really the end-to-end -end system by adding uh, this uh, grounded generation in a symbolic constraint, uh, so to speak. And there's another example we actually also used and uh, different uh, kind of evaluation there and uh, looked at the 50 dialogues per task you know, in uh, few short learning. Uh, similarly, you know, we are uh, significantly better uh, than others. So it gives us a significant confidence that, you know, this might be the right direction to go uh, if we actually want to move beyond uh, deep learning uh, to deep understanding. So this is uh, pretty much, you know, what I want to uh, talk to you today. And uh, hopefully I have given you some background about what, what has been happening last decades uh, in AI, in deep learning, uh, while exciting uh, it's time for us to move on, especially for the next five to 10 years. I believe that 
uh, it's going to be golden error for us to pursue hybrid neurosymbolic models uh, coupled with knowledge-driven cognitive model based uh, we might have a chance to uh, um, really uh, have a shot at a robust AI or at least we will make some significant progress there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I want to acknowledge uh, some of my uh, former colleagues for their contribution to this uh, uh, presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Shum, for those fascinating insights and into deep learning and deep understanding. Uh, our chat function has been very uh, engaged and active and I can see some really fascinating comments and interactions and here are just a selection. Um, Dink Munkhamad from KAIST has asked, how do we design reinforcement learning not to be very focused on one specific task? Yeah, I haven't really touched on uh, the reinforcement learning much, you know, in this uh, presentation. I did a hint that in the three, one of the three areas I personally would like to pursue and uh, towards the deep understanding is actually on simulators. To me, the, the, the real secret sauce for the uh, reinforcement learning and the, uh, including deep reinforcement learning, such as, you know, AlphaGo system, uh, is really the ability uh, uh, to build high quality simulators. And uh, as, you, as you try to learn with the reinforcement learning, which is basically, you know, by practicing, practicing, and you want to explore, you know, with this action, what you actually get. Uh, to me, I think uh, it might be a little bit of brute force. It might be a little bit too engineering focused. Uh, but I genuinely believe that, you know, we, uh, uh, if we are willing to spend $12 million to train a GPT-3 model, I think we should spend more money uh, to build high quality simulators. Okay, thank you for that response. Um, the next question comes from Rachel Tsai, and she's asked, do you think deep learning technology can continue to develop or is coming up to a dead end, considering the skyrocketing environmental cost and dishonest developers? Yeah, this is the, this is a fascinating question, and uh, I wouldn't bet against it. I think there's still a long way to go, <clears throat> still a long way to go, you know, for deep learning uh, to continue to uh, make big progress. Uh, but I did a caution you, you know, from this lecture that, you know, it's really the unreasonable effectiveness of uh, big data and also it's just unbelievable progress of uh, big compute uh, that have pushed us. But I'm also very encouraged uh, by uh, uh, the, the lot of, you know, good work uh, in recent years, uh, going back to the, the core of deep learning itself and what exactly we are learning. Uh, that's actually the second topic you know, that I mentioned that I believe the next five to 10 years will be very, very exciting. Uh, that is really deep understanding of, of deep learning itself. Uh, I wish I had the time to uh, talk a little bit about you know, Professor Ima's work from Berkeley. Uh, actually, in a different conference tomorrow, you know, he's going to give a keynote, probably share some of his uh, uh, stuff there. Uh, his paper also recently uh, published on archive about a month ago. Uh, it's really going back to, you know, what you try to optimize and uh, what is the optimization function there. And maybe I'll give you a very high level you know, answer there is that think about that over the years that, you know, what we have done, you know, for clustering, for classification, uh, for learning. And uh, uh, there is an objective function behind everything. Uh, now, you know, if we want to understand what's really going on, uh, maybe we should just revisit uh, the objective. Sure. Thank you for that response. I've been allowed to um, extend this session by five minutes because all uh, our participants would love to, to keep asking questions. So I do have one final question. I'm interested in how the pandemic is affecting the development of AI. For example, how is it disrupting research? Um, or, for example, are there any emerging AI-specific innovations that might alleviate the pandemic? Yeah, that's an, an excellent, excellent, excellent question. That uh, um, 
you know, I wish uh, the AI and the machine learning could have done more uh, to uh, fight the pandemic. Uh, no, of course, you know, there's uh, almost in you know, every aspect that, you know, machine learning, you know, has been you know, applied. Uh, just as a practitioner, I wish, you know, we could have done more. I have seen you know, a lot of very, very nice work and uh, uh, from scientific research community to really help uh, different people um, on how to fight this uh, pandemic. In the research field alone, you know, I must uh, call out the excellent work, you know, by uh, uh, Allen Institute of AI and also by Microsoft Research in preparing and uh, helping with the, uh, this large body of research literature and anything related to uh, fighting pandemic, you know, not only just in computer science, but more and more in health uh, so it's really excellent work, and uh, every day they actually update this huge database, uh, making sure that all kind of researchers can access to the, this kind of information in a timely manner. Uh, I uh, really appreciate this 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 kind of work, and uh, I think uh, uh, it's something that you know we together as a research community um, uh, should do. Well, thank you so much, Professor Sham. Um, I think that that has been such a, um, a productive and uh, amazing session, and I would like to thank you for your contribution to this um, global summer school and for all the um, organizing uh, team that has been behind this uh, session. I'd like to thank them as well. And that brings this session to a close. Thank you very much. So for some of you who are signed in for the first webinar, you can find that on the Xuetang X platform. Thank you very much.